We have two incredible joiners with us this morning to start things off. Uh, the first is John Alexander, and I expect most of you, if you don't know John, have certainly heard of him. He's been practicing green woodworking for about 30 years now and wrote an incredibly influential book on the topic called Make a Chair from a Tree, an Introduction to Working Wood. And that book has really been part of a huge revival of interest in doing traditional woodworking and especially working with green wood. The original book is out of print, but an enlarged edition is available for Mastergill Press. And in 1999, John followed it up with a videotape that's available. And as some of you may know, he operates an active website. So uh, I think he said he brought a 1,000 cards with him. And uh, he'll be happy to give you one if you beg enough. Um, John taught classes for 25 years, uh, both at his home and down at Drew Langsner's in North Carolina. He is no longer teaching, but is really focusing on his research and is working on a book entitled Make a Stool from a Tree, an illustrated introduction to 17th century New England joinery. And uh, I don't know, what's, what's your predicted publication date, John? Are you, is Heavens that? Heaven knows. Heaven knows, sometime in the mid 21st century. Um, he's studying his, his uh, are continuing his studies on traditional woodworking and chair making in 17th century joinery, and is really interested in comparing those techniques to ones that were used later on for Windsor chair making, just to see if there's a tradition and similarities that are continued there. In the meantime, he remains at the center of traditional woodworking, especially green woodworking and chair making. He's active in the Early American Industries Association and uh, is in constant, insatiable demand as a speaker and demonstrator. And we're very pleased to have John with us for the first time. Peter Follinsby, who's going to be working with him, actually trained with John um, beginning in 1980 uh, at Drew Langsner's uh, country workshops in North Carolina, and for several years attended classes there, taking a range of, of programs in traditional woodworking and a bunch of different topics, including timber framing, basketry, Windsor chair making, coopering, and spoon carving. And in 1988, he served a five-month internship down there and, and actually lived there and worked there. In the late 1980s, uh, his focal point, or he really became focused, I guess I should say, on uh, 17th century joinery and turning. Uh, he worked with John again to begin looking closely at 17th century pieces, worked with several museum collections and private collectors, and um, pointed out that Robert Trent, uh, and I'm quoting here, taught me not only how to look at original objects, but also how to research the period records to further the base of knowledge concerning the objects and their makers. And that has paid off for all of us in, in many, many ways. Peter has written and co-written several articles on 17th century furniture, most of which have been published in the, the Chipstone Journal, American Furniture. Since 1994, Peter has been the joiner and turner at Plymouth Plantation up in Massachusetts. And as you probably have all seen by looking at the work on the bench outside, he is a maker of reproduction English style furniture of the early 17th century. So with that, we're going to have an introduction to green woodworking from both John and Peter and illustrate that with the production of a 17th century joint stool. So it's all yours, gentlemen. Good morning. My name's John. I'm an informed amateur. <laughs> I have never practiced woodworking for a living, and that's what makes the difference. Uh, my very good friend, Peter, is a master craftsman, or a master joiner. He joins for a living. Uh, he learns hard and well, works hard and well, to get it done by the end of the day. It's been a wonderful journey, and uh, it's kept me uh, spirited and alive, I must say. And Peter's been a big help in that, too, because uh, uh, I was too busy to practice joinery. And with my little informed amateurish mind, I would come up with all these weird theories about how joinery did and didn't work. We have about eight feet of correspondence. Could be. Hingham, Massachusetts. Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, Peter would foolishly take all my suggestions and try to work them out, and most of them didn't. So uh, uh, he's passed me by, I am very glad to say, and I'm very glad to be here this morning. Peter? Um, it was maybe, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, we taught a class down at Drew Langsner's in how to make this joint stool. 
and Drew was dumb enough to hire us to teach this class, and we were maybe half a step ahead of the class, <laughs> and Jay Gaynor was one of the students who fell for it and took the class. Uh, and John and I would every so often say to the students, you guys wait here, and we'd run outside and figure out what to do next. <laughs> and then we'd come running back in. And apparently, Jay's memory has grown dim, grown dim because he chose us to work this program this week. I was thinking, what is... And, and um, then I thought about it, and I thought, well, who else is he going to get? Nobody else is dumb enough to do this stuff. So we're hoping today to go through the various steps that are uh, typical of what is entailed in building this joint stool. And uh, we will take questions as they come up and see what we can do with them, but occasionally we might have to say, yeah, it's a good question, let's get back to it, or we'll go off on some tangent and we'll end up with a chest or something instead of a stool. Uh, so I guess we'll start busting this piece of wood open. Right? No. Okay. Uh, what, what John's telling you is this work, woodwork has kept him alive, and uh, I've tried to kill him a number of times. <laughs> and uh, you have something to add? Go ahead and arrive. All right. This is a section that I've split out uh, with some wedges and a maul, and uh, you're going to see you're going to see the beginning later. And we're picking up somewhere near the beginning here, but Ted and Garland are going to split a log open for us. Uh, and what I'm going to do is just take a fro and this uh, large club and start to bust open this piece of red oak to make some of the rail stock. For a uh, for the stool. And that's pretty nice stuff. This is still fairly wet inside. Typically, I would cut that off down there. Uh, you, you pick that up, that curve in it, down at the bottom, is a nuisance generally. And, um, but uh, I can just get a flavor for what it's like to break this stuff out. This is a radial cut in the log. Go ahead, Peter. Oops. You want to talk about that sure. radial cut? A couple of things. You all know when you look at the cross section of an oak, you see these, I call them gangster pinstripes coming out, these slick rays pointing out from the center to the circumference. Those are the things that allowed Peter to rive this literally almost into a flat board. At that, take a look down it. Now come on top of it a little bit. You see that? Look, it's a board. No sawing. The characteristic of joinery is that you seldom, if ever, saw in the direction of the, of the long fibers, I call them. We call them the grain. Say long fibers. It is all done by riving. It's a little wasteful of wood, but when you're dealing with oak, where are you, Peter? You're dealing with oak, it's, it's the rivable wood of all rivable woods. It's a powerful wood. And that's why the joinery, English joinery, transmitted to America, is a study of rived oak. That's it. Oh, yeah, come on. There's some tops are pine, some decorative elements are made from maple, and so on. But essentially, the frame is an oak frame. Peter, what do you feel about that? If it isn't oak, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter talked about the curve at the bottom of this. This was probably, probably the butt swell of a tree. Yeah, right at the bottom. You see, and not only do you want to rive oak, but you want to rive the straight portion of the tree that's probably above the butt swell as it comes out of the ground and down from the biggest protruding limb. Now, there may be some concealed knots. You'll find them when you get in there. Uh, you'll work around it. But you will not essentially ever use in an important element knotty or curved uh, oak. Uh, 
Well, there's that goofy chair. Maybe the guy who did some there, but we won't worry about that. Uh, so that's what we're talking about, rived green oak. It rives much easier when it's green, and you'll find as you go through here, it's also going to work much better when it's green. And then you're going to find out when the stool is finished, it's going to be green, and then uh, it'll be sold when it's green. Not soaking wet anymore like it was from the tree, but there will still be substantial moisture. And when we build this, uh, this stool, where Peter builds it, I'm going to watch, uh, you'll see that the construction of the stool is designed to avoid the consequences of shrinkage. Peter? That's true. Uh, <laughs> you, you want to talk about that mortise and tenon. I, I guess we'll... What I'm starting there with the, um, with the riving out of that stock is beginning the, um, the stock preparation. And the crooks of the matter in building these funny little stools or any of the furniture we were looking at uh, last night with Tara is that mortise and tenon joint where the pieces fit one into the other. Uh, and they rely not on glue, not on a tight fit, but on the intentional misalignment of the holes in the mortise and the holes in the tenon and the tapered peg that will pull them together. The draw boring of that joint, is uh, that's what the technique is called. And that's how you can put these wretched pieces of firewood together and keep them together mm -hmm. uh, over the centuries. And that's going to be the main focus of what we're talking about today. Now what we're going to do, what we have done, uh, is based on an attempt to understand 17th century joinery. Now they're all dead. However, uh, there are documents. There are, in particular, two uh, books in English uh, and at least one in French, uh, which have a direct bearing on joinery, Joseph Moxon's book and Randall Holmes' uh, book, and we'll perhaps mention them from time to time. We've studied artifacts. Uh, very kindly, we've been allowed to go to museums and study uh, uh, traditional tools, uh, uh, tools which have survived, traditional furniture which has survived. Uh, there's one right over there in the corner. You'll see lots of more of them. Uh, there's a very incredible panel, a carved panel of a joiner's shop, which we will discuss. Uh, we also have gone and looked very carefully at the artifacts for tool marks to see what evidence of the techniques that were used. Is this sawn? Was this, uh, was this chiseled? Uh, was this scraped uh, with a scraper and so forth? In a sense, we have tried to reverse engineer 17th century joinery, and it's been a very, very exciting journey. My journey started with a stick chair, which is back here, uh, which is also a green woodworking subject, and it led to understanding how you rive wood and so on, but it didn't teach you about the drawboard uh, mortise and tenon, which is really the heart of the matter. Uh, the stool is an excellent thing to study, and, and we're going to get onto building the stool, but the reason is when you look at the stool, it has every element in a very simple version of the frame held together by pegs made of rived, moist, red, oh, red or white oak, excuse me. Uh, and uh, we may have time later to show you some pictures of period stools, and we have examples here of stools that we've made. The other thing that we learned in our research is that the tools are relatively few in number and relatively simple, sophisticated in thought and purpose, but uh, they're not routers, and they're, they're not jigsaws, and so forth and so on. So, yeah. Peter, let's go ahead and... Somebody was asking us last night about tools, and uh, we put them off, said, oh, don't even talk to us tonight. And uh, what you will find out is that it's a very small handful of tools that uh, can be pretty fundamental and you'll be able to do uh, almost any number of things uh, with a pretty basic toolkit. That peg, oops, anybody home? Right okay, you. this peg is going to hold together not only that stool, but a quart cupboard, a table, a large table, a bench, 
anything that can be made, uh, wall paneling, anything that can be made from rived, wet or moist green oak. That's it. Now that happens to be oak also, wouldn't you know? And of course these are the two, as Peter showed you, that make the joint. So I suggest we get the right, get along. Cut this off to get rid of this swollen part. Yeah, and talk amongst yourselves, this will be a second. Uh, what, I, what I always swear I'm never going to do is take my show on the road, and every few years I go ahead and do it again. How green is it, Peter, but, uh, you know, is it a couple of days after the trees? Or uh, this particular piece has been laying around a while. It's still very wet inside. You can work, you know, right when you fell the tree down, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. You still have strength. It'll stay wet inside for a very long time. What we found out this week is um, you're not supposed to bring green wood into a museum gallery. Uh, they're afraid there's someone living in the wood mm -hmm. that might want to come out. That's a pretty reasonable concern. <coughs> so if you see any little thing crawling, step on it. <laughs> so when you're splitting off that, that outer sap wood, uh, it usually fails miserably like that. So if I want to do this here, you can shoot that. So then you use your hewing hatchet, your joiner's hatchet, to get that sap wood out of there. So this is the table saw of our wood our toolkit the most dangerous tool we've got. What I try to do is keep my right leg behind me and I do this on a stump in the shop, not on a bench. It's just more stable, it's also a bigger surface. And I'm just eyeballing this now, this is not... Uh, what anything. are you making, Peter? Uh, just starting to split out rail stock. And this, the rails are the horizontals, okay? Bump, 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 around. So I'll come back to that hatchet. What I would do, this piece is just a little bulky, but it'll give you the idea of what we do. I'm going to take it to the bench, set up over there, and start to plane it. And then we can introduce uh, the planes used for this work. They're really horrible. And uh, it'll be fun to show them to you. All right. What you see is that uh, that piece of stock, if you can sight along it, is nice and flat. It's a very, very good split. Mm -hmm. Many times there'll be a twist in it. If you've got a log that winds or twists as you split it. That just means you have more work cut out for you. But in this case, it'll work up uh, very nicely. The first plane I'm going to use is called a four the, plane. The four plane. You, you may have heard it called a scrub plane. There's a continental version. Uh, there uh, is the There's blade. the blade, and it's a con Vex blade. I which, have to do that too. 
literally scrubs, the, and Peter's going to work right on the ray plane because it cuts so beautifully. Now, uh, I've read lots of things about planes, and fortunately, uh, I've been a horrible student all my life, and I usually don't pay any attention to what people tell me or what I read. And uh, it's important to have a nice, tight mouth on your plane is one of the things I've read. Mm -hmm. And this one, you could stick your finger in if you were so inclined. But that will let the shavings come off. Um, this sort of a plane takes a very heavy shaving. The idea being to take that riven surface and start to dress it down. Uh, I can't really convey for you the thickness of that shaving, but at the break you can come up and see them. And what that will also leave is, might be hard to pick that up, but a slightly furrowed result on the face of the board. Uh, again, that'll be something you can feel more than you can uh, see it. But the idea is to get the wood on the floor where it belongs. You'll notice that Peter is not using the vise. The uh, vise as we know it today was not uh, found in the 17th century New England joiner's kit. He's using what is called the bench hook, which is a piece of iron with teeth. That's the bench hook. It's set in a block, and you can raise and lower the block, don't bother Peter, by knocking with a mallet underneath. And Peter, as a good joiner does, determines his direction of, of, of the plane travel to drive the stock against the hook every time. And all I'm doing at this stage is sighting that by eye to see how close to flat it is, how close to straight it is, and... If Peter got tricky at this point, and he wouldn't, he would use winding sticks. Well, I wouldn't, because uh, this one is so wedge well, we, we right have, now. Well, we have a solution, Peter. Go. The winding sticks, I'll do them backwards for the camera. Uh, these particular ones have little pieces of, I think they're piano keys or something, let into them. And what you do is sight across those sticks. And if they're sitting this way, clearly your board is horribly twisted and your morning is ruined. And so all that happens is the length of those sticks exaggerates whatever twist is in your three inch, four inch wide piece of stock. And you scooch down and sight across them and they look perfectly reasonable. Or if they're twisted, you either go back to your hatchet, go back to your four plane, and start to correct uh, the problem. Peter, the piece that uh, you have there is triangular, triangular in cross-section. Mm -hmm. And how did that happen? Well, that's from the splitting. Uh, and you can uh, approach that a couple of different ways. What I'm doing this morning and what I typically will do is get one face flat and, and straight, one face you know, the way I want it. And then when I determine what the thickness of my stock is going to be, whether I'm going for two inch thick stock or one inch thick stock, I'll mark that out with a chalk line and either split or chop off this uh, offending mm -hmm. discrepancy in the cross section. So you can do some of that to begin with, but I always find it better to make one face finished and then deal with your thickness from that if you can. Sometimes it, the wedge shape is too exaggerated and you're tipped over working and gonna, gonna go over tea kettle there. But now I'm starting with a different plane. This one is one that I made. Uh, <laughs> this is a horrible plane. And uh, I love it. It's one of my favorites. Uh, if you are familiar with the ship, the Mary Rose, that sunk off of uh, Portsmouth, England, 1545, was recovered, I think, in the 1980s. Um, 
if Jane is around, she can correct me, she'll know better than I. But among the thousands and thousands of artifacts they brought up from that ship are carpenter's tools, a number of planes that you can say with certainty this plane ended its useful life in 1545. I copied this plane from uh, one in that collection. And it had this uh, section standing up right here that was a handhold. And I made the plane and I kept trying to work with it for, I don't know, a couple of years. And I finally decided it was made for a lefty because it felt great that way. <coughs> and it felt horrible this way. And I have a friend who's a carpenter at Plymouth Plantation with me who's left-handed. And I thought to myself, there is no way I'm giving him this plane. <laughs> so I cut that part off. <laughs> and um, I never really got the bottom truly flat. It's a little low right there. There's a very wide opening between uh, the blade and the body of the plane, a, a wide mouth. But for me, that lets the shavings come out. I don't want a fine setting on it because I'm not going to get that fussy if you saw some of that furniture last night. I, I tried to take some people and shove their heads inside one of those chests because it's just so awful in there. It looked like the firewood pile and the front of the chest was just so decorative. And uh, one of the things that happened is back in the late 80s when John started to show me this furniture, I looked at it and I said, well, I can do that. You know, that isn't that big a deal. And that was what attracted me to it. So this is a plane that I guess could function as a jointer. It's uh, probably a little long for a smooth plane and a little short for a jointer, but it could function that way. And I use it to follow the four plane, and it begins to smooth out the furrowed surface from, mm -hmm. the, um, from the four plane and is the beginning of getting a nice flat face. One of the benefits, if you've, uh, <coughs> if you've used quarter sawn stock from a sawmill, if you've used kiln dried quarter sawn stock from a sawmill, I'm sorry, I feel badly for you, <laughs> because this is the best piece of oak that you can get in the world this quartered split green wood. You can plane it that way, plane it this way. You're going to get pretty much the same result. This is what quarter sawn wood wishes it was, but it isn't. The, uh, the importance here also is you probably remember seeing on old furniture all the rays, those wonderful little big speckly things on the surface of the wood. That's because, and that's the plane that Peter's working on, that's also a gorgeous plane of weakness for riving. And these gentlemen in the 17th century, I don't think they stood back and said, look at these beautiful rays. Isn't that the gorgeous heart of the wood? It was the easy, unique way to get it. Every, those rays, those patterns that Peter showed you are really fibers, grains, just as powerful as the grain that runs this way and they run in and out of the tree, and they weaken the tree so it's almost perforated for you. So it's, it's waiting to be used without excessive labor, without excessive tools, without the necessity for sawing. And the saw will never follow a ray split as accurately as a splitting wheel. Right. Okay, now why don't we, why don't we get, uh, get to start <coughs> working on a rail, Peter? This is, you're very yeah. fascinating, you know, and I, I, I could listen to you all day. But, yeah, but move right along, is that what you're trying to tell absolutely. me? Absolutely. This well, will be the signal, Peter. Yes, well, okay. uh, there was uh, one other thing. The next step in working this, before I, will true up, before I would true up the edge, I'll take a ruler and prick a couple of marks from that face. Um, sorry, I didn't tell you, I checked that with a straight edge held it against here just to see if it's pretty flat, and it is. Uh, and then I'd prick a couple of marks and use a chalk line. I will use a shameless Brought to you by the Sears Robot hardware company. store chalk line. And um, somewhere... While you're looking, Peter, can you look, look here at this very interesting 17th century ruler? It's in the book. 
This, the smallest dimension on the 17th century joiner's ruler, according to Mr. Moxon, is a quarter of an inch. The ruler is two feet long. And there's other indications also from inventories, which we've also read, uh, and maybe a, a hint, I think maybe in Randall Holm, I'm not sure, that this is the standard joiner's ruler. Not five, six feet, not a folding ruler, not sixteenths, thirty seconds, quarter inches. Very interesting. It's, it's great. It's marked out in quarter inches, and Joseph Moxon talks about measurements of half of a half of a quarter, which is a sixteenth of an inch, mm -hmm. but they're not going to call it that. And it's two feet long, and they sell wainscot paneling by the yard. <laughs> and, and Jane, I'm sorry, but these English are nuts. <laughs> um, so I'll just use a modern chalk line. I've misplaced the one that I wasn't going to use anyway, that is a wooden reel. And I lost the mark, but let's say it's there. All right. May and I? It, yeah, go ahead and pluck that line. Ew, I'm so excited. So at that stage, you get a little bit of a line, and then I just do want to hit that with the fro, and then uh, we'll go back and work on the next rail. So I'm going to just dodge right over to there. I'll scoot you around you. Yep. Uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is because now uh, I'll start to bring that down to um, closer to the thickness that I want it to be. And this is when you either lose the work you've just done for the past five minutes, or you save a whole lot of work for the next one. And uh, there are many, many uses this stuff can go to. So I've gone just outside my chalk line with the fro and driven that in there. And you can't usually split this stock other than in half. So that piece is doing what we call running out to the waist side nicely. And then I'll flip it around from here and hit that again. In the finished furniture, it doesn't matter if it has a tapered cross section. And then a little bit of hatchet work would bring that around and you've got your, your thickness. Peter, having hatcheted this to perfection, has ended up with what we're going to call rail stock because oh, we're going to work on this rails is the first. Julia Child part of the program. Mm -hmm. Peter's allowed only, of course, pure water during this presentation. Uh, I have a section here that I I prepped. Uh, I don't know before I came down, and I've marked out the horizontal aprons. The upper rails on the stool are called aprons. And I have marked them out here. I don't know if we're picking that up. We're just scratching them with an awl and a square. Hmm. I had one. Yeah, you did. I told you, don't take your show on the road. Why would Hi, you Ted, you got a square over here I can borrow? Yes. Thank you. You can uh, use this. You have, did you find the awl? I have an awl. Okay, sorry. So just laying your square on there, scribing it, not with a pencil, with an awl. I had a guy who worked in my shop for a while, a great craftsman, used a pencil. And I used to tell him, you know, I don't really want you using that pencil. And um, I came into work one morning, there was a pencil on the bench, and I took a back saw and cut it into 20 pieces. <laughs> and when he showed up to work, I, said, I found this on the bench, and I cut it up so it wouldn't hurt anybody to get it out of there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he, pencils were very rare in the 17th century. And the uh, awl is a wonderful marking tool across the grain. Uh, so I've marked those out. Um, and then I'll use the mortise gauge. What we're doing is laying out the tenons on these pieces. 